come is shoulda, coulda, woulda. And uh, it's, a, it's a series that we're, we've been learning about how to leave regret in the rearview mirror, and really in the rearview mirror, not so that we're always checking the rearview mirror, like making fewer mistakes so that we're living with fewer regrets. And we've been tackling all kinds of different angles of this that give us a, a framework to, to remember what's important. So I took some time to unpack this graphic, and week after week I do this, and if you've missed it, I'm just going to go over it one more time. So you and I, generally speaking, we understand the black and white stuff, right? We understand that, that, that if something's wrong, it should be red light, and if it's, if it's right, that should be green light. It's the middle stuff. It's the gray areas we struggle with, the stuff that isn't expressly forbidden or outright illegal, and we, we sometimes use it as an excuse to live there instead of realizing that's a time-sensitive moment. That's a de decision that we need to make. We need to decide in that moment, just like you come to a, a yellow light. Do I treat it like a green and go through? Or do I treat it like a, a, a red and stop? So we've been talking about how to make those better decisions over time. And uh, you know what? I, I want to just kind of mention this as, as, we, as we talk about our topic today. I have just as many regrets as anybody in this room. As, as I look back on my life, there are things I wish I'd said, things I wish I'd done, things I, I wish I hadn't, just like you. So I, I've been learning, I've been growing, and, and that's what I've been trying to share with you these last couple of weeks. So I, I don't know if, if you've been thinking about it or whether you know that it's leading to this during this series, but today we're gonna talk about this last I wish and it's this one. I wish I'd chosen courage. I wish I would I wish I would have done the brave thing. I wish I would have spoken up. I, I wish I would have stepped out. I wish I would have defended her or him. I wish I would have chosen that opportunity instead of taking the easy path. You and I, as we're faced with decisions, we, we're constantly wrestling the cost analysis. We're doing this thing like just, just like we do in business. What, what will happen? What, what will happen if, I, if it fails? What will happen if I'm embarrassed? What happens if, if I'm judged for this? And, and sometimes we let the, the kind of the, this looming sense of what could happen to us in a negative sense stop us from doing and being what we need to do, and I've done that so many times. I have stood in situations frozen when I know I'm supposed to do something. I found myself in countless moments where I know God wants me to say something and I don't open my mouth. I find myself in those kind of situations too, but what I can tell you is this, today, I am living what I thought would be impossible 10 years ago. That I can tell you. 10 years ago, I wanted to be this courageous. I, and I'm not saying that to brag. I'm telling you that Jesus is real and that what he's done in my life is incredible. Like, if you knew me 10 years ago, you would not know me as the bold person I am today. I'm a different guy that way. I, I, I've taken it to an entirely different level. What I can also tell you is this. Now that I'm here, I want to be there. So I have not arrived. Now, now, that I, now that I'm bolder than I've ever been, now I'm looking going, oh, I wish I could be like him. I wish I could be like her. Now other things are possible that, that I wouldn't have even considered 10 years ago because of the boldness that God has put in my heart today. I, I, as many of you know, or some of you know, I'm, I was asked to be a director at large for the Northern Hills Community Association. And so I come to these meetings to pretend to know what I'm talking about as they talk about budgets and plans and, and zoning and all kinds of stuff. Mm, yeah, good point, Bob. I, I just, I'm kind of faking it so far. And I, I, <laughs> I did, I did confess to one of the ladies that kind of drew me into this thing. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I feel so out of my depth. And, uh, but, but during this last meeting, just this last week, as you, as you can imagine, I'm praying the whole time. I'm, I'm like, God, how do I contribute? I feel like such a doofus. I don't have any like, marketable skills that are useful to this team. All of this stuff. 
Um, and, and I'm also put there for a reason. I feel like I've got this, this, this responsibility because God has opened up this opportunity for me. Don't blow it, right? So this is my equivalent of some of your workplace moments. Like I, I feel like I don't want to wreck my working relationship with these people because this is such a great opportunity. But during the meeting, I, I look over at one of these ladies that, that, that kind of helped recruit me to this thing, and I just see this heaviness on her. And as I pray about it, I realize God is saying to me, I want you to go talk to her right after the meeting. So then for the whole meeting, I'm like, end, end, end. I want the whole meeting to end. It's going longer, longer, longer. But I, the whole time, I feel like God's saying to me, I'm going to give you a word for her. I want you to share it with her, and I want you to pray with her. So I did. Right at, right at the end of the meeting, I just pulled the chair over and said, hey, I can just see that there's like this huge weight on you. You're carrying all this responsibility, and I... I see that you really feel alone in this. And she's tearing up. And her response was, oh, you're so intuitive. I'm like, no, <laughs> I am not intuitive. <laughs> I'm bold, but I'm not intuitive. And so, and, and then I said, can I, can I pray for you? And I just said, you know, God loves you and he, he wants to guide you in this. You are not, he wants you to know you're not alone. I pray with her, with everyone sitting around, you know, as everyone's milling around after the meeting. I can tell you, I, this is such a thrilling moment for me. As I walked away from that moment, I realized I didn't have a single moment of nervousness about that. Like, not one. Now, I still have moments. Like, when I'm, I'm in Superstore, I'm being called to pray for someone and for healing or something, and they're, they're like, really mangled or something. My heart starts to pound. I, I get, like, but this was one of those moments where I went, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done in my life, because I would not have done that 10 years ago. And eight years ago, I would have been losing my marbles trying to figure out how to get into that position and how to broach the subject. And now here I am just doing it. And, and, and it made me hungry for more. Like, I, I want to be bolder than I've ever been. Does anyone here wish you were bolder? Don't you wish you wouldn't you stop sitting on your own hands and, and rationalizing why you don't step out, why you don't say things? Wouldn't it be amazing that this could be the year you say, enough of that. I, I'm leaving that behind. Jesus, make me brave. Whatever it takes, whatever you got to do in me, let's do it. So I want to share with you today some things that, that have really helped me in my journey and, and some things I've been reflecting on just recently. One of them is, is exactly what you're feeling right now. As you look back at things you wish you had done, there's a sense that you've missed something. You've missed out. Like, like something different could have happened. A different trajectory could have been launched in your life. And here you are sitting wondering what could have been. You know, decades ago, I don't know how long. When did Braveheart come out, Tom? Do you have, do you have any idea? 95 or something. That, that movie, Hello. I know, I'm a guy. Roll your eyes at me. Whatever. I don't care. That movie rocked me, and not just because heads were rolling, but because of that famous speech by William Wallace as his countrymen are beginning to fold, and they're, they're, they're facing the English across this field, this vast army that they're not equipped to face, and it's just these guys holding plowshares and, and homemade weapons, and they don't even know how to face this army, and William Wallace comes out and tries to inspire them to face the English, and you know this, you know this quote, he says, every man dies, not every man really lives. I am William Wallace, and I see a whole army of my countrymen here in defiance of tyranny. You've come to fight as free men, and free men you are. What will you do with that freedom? Will you fight? And in the face of this massive army that, that could result in certain death, one of the veterans in the crowd says, fight against that? No. We will run. And we will live. We will run. And we will live. And he replies, I fight and you may die. Run and you'll live at least a while. And dying in your beds many years from now, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that for one chance? Just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our... Oh boy, I think we would have died on that field. Okay? <laughs> I should have warned you that that was coming. Okay? Join me in the crescendo of my countrymen. Uh, 
So, so seriously though, what, what this speech taps into, and the reason it's so famous, is that this is a, an actual fear that we face. Like, what will happen on our deathbeds? What will happen as we look back? I talked last week about, regardless of the fact of how, how much money you've made, or how, how many ladders you've climbed in the corporate world, no matter how many friends or followers you have, your life and my life will be reduced to the size of this little white rectangle in a hospital room with a pillow at the end, and we will wonder, and we will look back, and hopefully we will not live with regret. Last week we met a guy named the Apostle Paul, who in that position said, I fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. And we want to live that kind of life. So this week, one of the texts I got back, Tom referenced this before, so hey, text me you're glad I did, kind of thing. I chose this instead of that. Uh, so this, this week, someone responded to this, and this is what they wrote. I'm going to show it to you on the screen. I'm going to read it here. So cool. This series has greatly impacted my life. Two exclamation points. Bam. <laughs> I have lived in some big regrets for a really long time. I decided no more going forward. One of those regrets involved not being honest in a relationship for the last seven years. I exchanged fear of rejection for courage and stepped out in boldness and honesty and talked with the person. I healed and grew, a huge weight was lifted, and as a result, I will relate differently in all my relationships going forward. God is so good, amen? People. Jesus is changing lives here. And I want to encourage you, encourage, to see what I did there? I want to encourage you. That means to imbue with courage. That's the purpose of encouragement. I want to encourage you to step out and speak up. And when God does something in your life, share with someone else. Because that applause isn't just cheering for that person. That, that applause is courage rising in you. Going, I want to do that. I want to be that. So today as we talk about courage... I want you to think of something in your life where courage is absent. I want, to, I want you to think of a situation you're facing where, where you know fear is part of the equation, where you're being tempted to do the wrong thing or a lesser thing. And I want you to think of it's a conversation or it's a, something you're supposed to give up, something you're supposed to start, a change you're supposed to make in your life, a commitment you're supposed to make. I want you to wrestle with that sucker down while I'm talking. Okay? Deal? Be, be those people that don't just listen to a message on courage, but do something with it. Now, you know, <laughs> yeah. nobody will know. <laughs> I want to tackle uh, a well-known story this morning from a different angle. How many of you are familiar with David and Goliath? The story of David and Goliath. If you, if you haven't read the story, you've heard of the story. If you haven't heard of the story, you've heard someone use the metaphor. So this has become a cultural fixation in our, in our, in our, kind of in our cultural consciousness. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about a guy named Saul. Because David and Goliath started as a story about Saul and Goliath. I don't know if you ever thought of it that way. But King Saul was, a, was the first king of Israel. So Israel was being governed by God. It was a theocracy, not a democracy, not a meritocracy, a theocracy. And the people of Israel said, we want a king like the other kids. All the other kids have a king. He's like, fine, I'll give you a king. So Saul is that king. So he, he selects, God selects Saul. Saul is a specimen. Saul is head and shoulders taller than anyone in Israel. I mean, he is a hulk. He is awesome, right? He's super imposing, great figurehead for the very first king. 
And so he's installed as king, and wouldn't you know it, at some point early in his reign, he finds himself at war with the Philistines. It's like the arch nemesis of the Israelites. And the Philistines gather on one side of this valley, and the Israelites gather on the other side of the valley, and they're preparing for war. And they're, they're heckling each other, and they're, they're waiting for someone to shoot the first arrow so that they can launch and run into this valley and kill each other. Right? And so in the context of all of this, as the tensions mounting, I don't know if you can feel it, you can feel the tension. How, how would that even you know, feel to be on the crest of that hill, looking at the army on the other side, just knowing that this is a tinderbox, just waiting to go up, that we're going to rush into this valley, blood is going to be shed. And Saul is sitting in the back. He's the general. He's, he's the one commanding the troops. He's looking at this whole thing playing out. What does he do? What does he do? He's never fought in a battle before, but he's huge, right? So, so people are looking to him, looking to him for leadership. Well, out of the crowd of the Philistines, somebody who's been sitting down stands up. You know those people that stand up and you say, no, no, stand up? This, this guy, he stands up and you're like, whoa! And it's a guy named Goliath. So a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span. I looked this up. In my notes, it says nine foot nine. <laughs> this guy makes Shaquille O'Neal look like the little brother that should have drank milk. <laughs> this is what he looks like. He is a beast. He is unnaturally, supernaturally big. He's got like a sloping forehead and hair coming out of his knuckles. He's got like, he's, he's just intense, okay? So his height was six cubits in his band. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighed 5,000 shekels. That's 125 pounds of armor. There are people in this room that don't weigh 125 pounds. You could be 250 pounds if you put the armor on. <laughs> on his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung in his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod. I have no idea what that means, but that sounds big. <laughs> <laughs> and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. The point, the tip of the spear is 15 pounds. 15 pounds. 15. <laughs> His shield bearer went ahead of him. It's like the golf cart, right? It's like he's coming along. It's his caddy. Comes along with him, just in case he needs something, a beer, I don't know. So, Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And what, look at this, totally calls him out. And are you not the servants of Saul? Saul's like, oh, you have to mention my name because everyone's like, wow, right? And you're a servant of Saul. Choose a man. Now he's just put a name in their minds. Choose a man. Could be anyone, really. Servants of Saul. Saul, heard you're really tall. Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight me and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And then the Philistines said, to this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. Okay, little Saul's, what are you feeling right now? It is on. He just called him out, and everybody looks up the hill at Saul, who is by far the biggest guy around. And they're like, what you gonna do, boss? <laughs> so Saul's like retreating into his tent, and he gives in to fear. He's like, I can't, you, look at him. He's massive, I can't face something that big. So it's not even a him, it's a thing. The thing out there, it's not even human. I can't face this. And, he, and he's, he's cowering in his tent. 
So Goliath comes out and does this every day for 40 days. By the way, Bible in the Bible, 40 days is hugely significant. So he comes out 40 days. He's taunting God. He's taunting the people of Israel and the armies of Israel. 40 days. And you got to know, every day that goes by, Saul, is, his, his heart is sinking deeper into the pit of his stomach. People are losing respect for him because he's not budging. And the Philistines know they have him exactly where they want him. But on the 40th day, a shepherd boy shows up on the battlefield. Shepherd boy named David, who's just a youth. He's just a kid. And he, he arrives just as Goliath is doing his daily taunt. And David's like, what, what, what is he saying? Well, he's been doing this for 40 days. It's huge. We're trying to figure out how to break the stalemate. We don't know what to do. And you're like, David's going, and you just let him do this? Uh, yeah. Like, you're going to stop him? I think I will. Somebody's got to do this. I don't care how big he is. He's, he's defying the armies of the living God. So, so finally he asks around, and people are like, well, talk to Saul, because it's, it's his call, man. So he gets an audience with Saul, and he, he comes before Saul, and he says, um, so, like, nobody's dealing with this? No, well, I'll do it. But you can't do it. You're just a kid. He's like, hey, <laughs> I'm, I might just be a kid, but God gives me strength. Look, I, I was a shepherd. I, I have, like, killed a bear and a lion with my bare hands. They were attacking my flocks. The, this, 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 this Philistine will be just like one of them. It's not going to be a big deal. Because it's not about the size of the giants. It's the size of my God that matters. It doesn't matter how tall I am. It doesn't matter at all. It's about the size of my God. And so God's with me. So just, just point me in the right direction. I'll do this. So Saul tries to fit him in his own armor, and David's like, I can't wear this. I don't, I'm not used to it. It's too heavy. It chafes. All of this stuff. So finally, he, he lets go of the armor, and he walks, he walks to the middle of this valley. In the bottom of the valley, there's a stream running through it. And all he's got, all he's got with him is this sling. He doesn't even have stones in the sling. So he goes to the middle of the valley, and he picks up the stones while both armies are watching. And he's like, ah. you know, he's cleaning up. Oh, that'll, that'll work nicely. Picks up these stones and faces down this giant. Now, imagine again, Saul is watching. Can you imagine? What, what would go through your mind? It must have been the fact that the stalemate had to break. Maybe Saul's like, I can't stand it. So if we lose, we lose. That's fine. But why would you send a boy into battle? I don't understand that, that call. So it shows what a coward he is. But can you imagine Saul watching David walk into this valley, pick up those stones with every eye on him? Nobody's looking to Saul anymore. And David gets these stones, faces down the giant, does his whole like Thor's hammer thing. You know, <laughs> tongue off this giant's forehead. Hits the ground. It's way better. If you're this a podcast, it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> Into the mud, picks up the sword, cuts off, cuts off his head, you know, and this blood spurting all over the place. And the, the crowd, can you like you know, like when someone goes up for a big dunk and everyone holds their breath? This is what happens. Goliath falls, and it is quiet, and then a second later, everyone's like, ah! just erupts right in the Israelites are going nuts, and they come running down the hill, and Saul is watching the moment that should have been his run away. The story should have been Saul and Goliath. That was his call. He had 40 days to step up. And he chose cowardice instead of courage, and then spent the rest of his life jealous of the guy who stole his calling in his mind, when if that was his, it could have been his. I'm not saying David shouldn't have become king, your prophecies and all that. I get it. God could have worked stuff around that. I'm telling you that was Saul's moment. And he missed it. Spent the rest of his life reimagining the back of David's head wishing he were that guy. 
You and I both know what that feels like when, when situations come and go and we wish we had chosen courage or somebody steps up and then we come up, come to them after the meeting, I'm so glad you said something, that's what I was thinking too. Oh, now you're so brave, awesome, right? But somebody had to go first. This happens all the time, all the time. What happens in the story is a huge turning point for each one of us. We read that on hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. You do understand that fear has a voice. It whispers to us, it bellows to us. And the point, the goal of fear is to diminish you, to steal things from you that are yours by right. If you'll just step up with faith and courage. This is what fear does. Every fear you bow to shrinks you. Saul's trajectory is a man who is entrusted with incredible things from God and spent the rest of his life becoming a lesser man, becoming a lesser man, becoming a lesser man. While David, who started as a lesser man, becomes greater and greater and greater as he trusts God. Now, the question then becomes, I'm gonna drink carefully. Yay. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I chose courage, I tried it again. Look guys, you can hardly see it. Okay. Um, <laughs> the question then becomes, what's the difference between Saul's heart and David's heart? Why would a shepherd boy just arriving on the scene, seeing it objectively, granted, but why would he choose such a radically different path than King Saul? Why would he do it? I want to suggest to you, it doesn't say this in the story, but as we back up and we look at who David was, David lived in God's love. You might think, well, what does that have to do with courage? You'll see. David lived immersed in the love of God, enraptured by the love of God, filled by the love of God, secured by the love of God, propelled by the love of God, focused by the love of God. Look, I'm going to give you just a few scriptures. This is from the Psalms. I, I inserted these this morning. There are probably dozens more. Okay? You don't hear this coming out of Saul's mouth. You only hear it coming out of David's. <clears throat> David says, I trust in your unfailing love. He says, how priceless is your unfailing love. He says things like it's a declaration, surely goodness and love will follow me, which means as I walk down into this valley, to face this giant, love and goodness are following me down there. That's what he's living with. Your love is ever before me. It's in my face. It's on my mind. It's on my lips all the time. The earth, in fact, is full of his unfailing love. And your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. I love you, O oh Lord, my strength, there's a verse where David actually says, your love, O oh Lord, is better than life. If I had to choose between life itself and an experience of God's love, I'm going with the love of God. So David, as a young man, facing this incredible foe, is convinced that everywhere he looks is the love of God. That the love of God is underneath him. The love of God is filling him. He is secure. He is maybe not safe, but he's secure and he knows it. And he walks up to that giant knowing that he is in the circle of God's love and power. When you know, and I mean know, like deep within you, that you are treasured, that you are loved. When you understand how secure you are, as a believer in Jesus, when you understand 
he would rather die than live without me. When you realize that love is in me, around me, propelling me, how can you not be courageous? David understood that perfect love casts out fear. It was love, believe it or not, even though it became a gruesome moment, it was love that propelled him down the side of that valley and back up the other side. Crazy. Not what you think, right? And because David was filled with God's love and lived in his love, he trusted God. So it didn't matter. I don't think it mattered. I, I really think he, he believed that the giant was going down. I, I, I believe it. But in a way, it didn't matter. Because love was propelling him. This is how I can show my love for God. This is how I can show my love for my countrymen. I'm doing this whether I come back out of this valley or not. I'm doing this whether anyone follows me or not. I'm doing this whether it's popular or not. I'm doing this because I have a God who loves me. Period. End of story. The decision's already made. So good. So good. You know, you and I spent so much time trying to work up courage. What if we have it wrong? What if you don't lack courage? What if Jesus, especially if you're a follower of Jesus, what if your new self in Christ has courage? It's just that the presence of fear in you invalidates that courage or, or somehow covers it up, makes you forget it's there. What if the love of God casting out that fear will release the courage you already have? What if it's a journey of becoming or realization rather than grabbing hold of something you don't possess? What if when that fear is out of the way, courage is just what you do? This is what I'm seeing in David. He's, he's living in the love of God. He didn't have to tell himself, be brave, be brave, be brave. He's like, no, this is the right thing to do because I'm filled with the love of God. God loves me. I'm fine. I'm good. We'll work this out. And off he goes. So awesome. So now think of that conversation, that thing you're facing. You, you think it's the conversation you're fighting. You think it's the person you're fighting. You think it's, it's something outward that you have to overcome. But what if the real giant you're facing is your fear? What if that's the real giant? What if, the, if that giant falls? you'll be able to do what you've been wanting to do all along. Can you imagine how it felt? Those Israelites on the edge of that hill, by the end, either they're gonna to wanna to go home or they're just dying to get in there and swing some swords already. I'm tired of talking, I'm tired of waiting. Do you know what happened when that giant fell and David cut his head off? There's a, a war cry and the Israelites flood. It's like the, the courage in them is released when the fear is broken. And they come, they come spilling down the side of the hill like a flood. And the Philistines, ah, the Philistines break camp and they, they panic and run. And the Israelites rout them completely. So good. In a moment, changed by one person's courage. I've said this before, but I want to tell you again, regardless of what you're facing, listening to fear is always the wrong decision. Always. You know, I posted this online and someone said, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's not always the wrong thing. What if I'm standing on the edge of a cliff? Then what? I'm like, that's not fear keeping you from jumping. That's wisdom. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> ha,
Work with me. Let's, let's just think it through with me. <laughs> You're asking this question. Giving in to fear, listening to fear, giving fear a voice is always the wrong decision. Always. Fear is not from God. Period. <laughs> Here's the crazy thing about fear, too. Moms, dads, sisters, brothers, fear is contagious. Cowardice is contagious. Saul, refusing to do the wrong thing, quaking in his boots, now his entire army is afraid. And they're shaking, they're, they're, they're paralyzed by their fear. It's contagious. If I'm afraid, he's afraid, the biggest guy here is afraid, maybe I should be afraid. And then suddenly we embrace fear together and we're, we're caught and we're held back, right? And then David steps up and says, yeah, well, so is courage, my guy. <laughs> courage is contagious too. Because as, as soon as David steps up and does what all of them wish they had the guts to do anyway, now it's like, oh, and they, they rush down the hill and they do good. And guess what happens to the Philistines? Cowardice is contagious. So now it flips sides. Fear jumps camp. Now they're like, ah, oh, and they run. You see the power of fear. You see the power of love and courage. So here's, here's my wrapping thought for you. This entire series, we've been talking about asking the wisdom question. What would a wise person do? 85% of the time, that's a great question. But here's the problem with it. Wisdom didn't move David down into that valley to face a giant. That's stupid. <laughs> Just saying. What's the wise thing to do? Like if a wise person were standing in my shoes, would he walk down towards a giant with no armor on, with a sling with no rocks? Would he do that? Does that sound like a wise thing to do, people? No, it was not wisdom that moved him to do something courageous. It was love. So in that moment, what I want, what I want to say to you is, I'm going to give you a better question. Don't even ask yourself, what would a courageous person do? You ask yourself, what would love do? Because I'll tell you what, love flows through a, a desperate mother, fills her with adrenaline, and she lifts a car off of her offspring. That's love. It's not wisdom. It's love. Love motivates our Savior to come for us when we can't come for him. Love motivates our Savior to reach out and touch a leper that would defile anybody else. Love causes our Savior to spend time with a woman at a well where people could talk and gossip, but he doesn't care because he loves that woman. Love casts demons out of people who are afflicted. Love reaches into darkness. Love doesn't mind getting its hands dirty. That's not wisdom, folks. That's love. So here's the thing. Good question. Maybe 75% of the time. What would the wise person do? What, what, what should I do if I were really, really, really wise? Just understand that at the moments when courage is required, you will hide behind the wisdom question. And you will use it to excuse yourself from doing something risky and costly. And the irony is, if you choose to excuse yourself from doing what's risky and costly and courageous, if you choose not to go the path of love, if you choose, choose instead to go the, the way of wisdom, what's safe, what's predictable, what's prudent, you end up becoming a fool. So the only real way to know what to do in any given situation is to walk with love himself, in whom 
are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, that's Jesus, but also is the, the consuming fire that made the world, the love that would endure the cross for you and for me. That's the only way. You've got to walk with God. At the end of this series, there's no principle for this. There's only a relationship with the God who wants to reveal his heart to you. That's it. It's the only way. And David going on and on, your love is better than life. Your love is always before me. That could be you. And I guarantee you, if that's what's on your heart, if that's what's flowing through your veins, you will be wise and you will be courageous. Because love is both. Love is both. One date in recent history permanently seared its mark onto America's conscience. September 11th, 2001. This defining moment exposed the best and worst things about us. It forced us to look in the mirror as a nation, this is obviously from stateside, and ask ourselves what really matters. The terrorists who slammed airplanes into the World Trade Center caught us completely off guard. In the middle of a business as usual morning, they showed us how naive we were about the magnitude of their hate and the extent to which we could be humbled by their violence. And many successful people found themselves trapped in the clutches of this ghastly event. At 9.03 that Tuesday morning, their SAT scores and the cars they drove to work meant nothing. There was very little that their pedigrees and resumes could do for them. The famous as well as the obscure became equals in the statistics. In the Twin Towers, who's who died side by side with who's he. But in the midst of this crisis, there were magnificent people who responded to the urgency of the moment and gave everything they had for the sake of others. As the successful rushed down the stairs of the World Trade Center, the truly great ran up. As the well-heeled and comfortable ran for their lives, the truly great slipped inside the nightmare to see what they could do to help those who were left behind. What a convicting little piece. What are you facing? What are you facing? What are you afraid of doing? What is it? What are you afraid of saying? Name it. That's your Goliath. Name it. Understand it. Look down the hill at it. Understanding that you facing that thing you're afraid of may have far-reaching implications. You don't want to be a Saul looking at the back of someone else's head as God calls them to do what you were afraid to do. You don't want to look back and miss out. And if you're that person who knows you've already done that and you're already living with that, there is grace and there is forgiveness for you. I believe that at any moment, Saul could have changed this story. He could have jumped up and cheered for David. He could, have, he could have jumped in on the story and instead of feeling threatened by him, said, I have something to learn from this kid. I want to be just like him. He could have done it. But instead he closed up and became less and became less and became less. Don't be that guy, that, you know, that gal. Choose to face what you're afraid of and do it. Asking God, fill me with the love that will cast out this fear because I don't want to live a lesser life than Jesus died a horrible death to give me. You can look back after 10 years and say, I'm braver now than I thought I'd ever be. And there's more. And there's more. There's always more.